Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar, Embracing Change, How RAIN RFID is Transforming Retail. I'm Allison Porter, Director of Content and Campaigns at Impinge. Today, we're having a conversation with Brian Kilcourse from Retail Systems Research and Gaylene Meyer from Impinge about how RAIN RFID is transforming retail, pulling key findings from a recent RSR report a deep dive into retailers' views about RFID and the Internet of Things. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a couple of things. The RSR report is available to you now. You'll find it in the navigation pane under the title Handouts. Click on the icon to download it. If you have questions during the session, please post them to the questions box in the right-hand control panel. We'll answer questions in the Q&A session at the end. Okay, now let's get into it. With us today, we have two longtime retail and technology executives who have seen the retail industry go through a lot, including navigating a pandemic. Please join me in welcoming Brian Kilcourse from RSR and Gaylene Meyer from Impinge. Gaylene, will you please start us off by briefly introducing yourself? Thank you, Allison. I'm Gaylene Meyer. I'm Impinged Vice President of Global Marketing and Communications. In my role today, I focus on IoT marketing strategy and market education across many industries, uh, working to help people understand how RAIN RFID contributes to an enterprise digital transformation strategy. But for the past 20 years, I've led teams focused mostly on retail technology initiatives. And I've had the pleasure of working with Brian Kilcourse many times over my career. Brian, it's great to be here with you today. Nice to see you, Gaylene. Um, I should probably tell people a little bit about myself and my company. I'm a managing partner at RSR Research. We're a very small firm, and we focus on the business use cases that drive technology adoption in retail. I've been in retail an embarrassingly long time. I actually got my first retail job in 1970 and in those days, if you if you demonstrated any interest in technology at all, you'd get trained. So I got trained to become a programmer and then a manager and finally a CIO, where I was a CIO for many years. Um, I became a CEO of a B2B media company in the early 2000s. And it was at that company that we started the business that became RSR. In 2007, my partners and I bought it out. We went solo and that brings us right up to date. Here we are right now talking about one of our benchmark reports and what we found in it. Thank you, Gaylene. Thank you, Brian. All right, to get started, I think we have to acknowledge we are in a post-COVID world and retail is one of those industries that is forever changed. Some retailers thrived while others just, just tried to survive. Can you tell me more about what you're seeing, Brian? What has changed in retail? Who's changing? And how have your habits and experiences as a consumer been affected? It's a great question. It's a big question. It could take up the whole hour, but I'll see if I can summarize it. Um, let's, let's talk about first about consumer expectations. The first thing that we need to pay attention to is the fact that the pandemic really was an accelerator for a lot of different, different things in retail, things that had started well before but they accelerated dramatically. And one of the things is what we call the omni-channel shopping journey, something we all take for granted. We start our shopping journey in the digital domain, usually on our mobile phone, even when we intend to go to the store to complete the purchase. So it has digitized the whole front end of that, of that dialogue, if you will, with the retailer. This has really had a fundamental uh, impact on the retail business model. The retail business model was built around a simple notion. It was that demand would be generated in store and it would be fulfilled in the store. Now demand can be triggered anywhere, literally anywhere in the world, 24 by seven, and it can be fulfilled in a number of ways. Direct to consumer, from store A to store B, to the store, um, and in all, all kinds of places in between. When you think of retailers' jobs, it's really about bringing demand and supply together. That's what the business does. But now it's vastly more complicated. When I'm talking about a supply chain, one of the things I point out 
is it's not really even a chain any longer, it's a network. And so is demand, demand is a network. So this is, brings up this notion of being able to see what's happening in your business. In the old days, you could just look, you walk in the store and you could see the business, you could tell within minutes whether the store was working or not for the consumer. Now you have to be able to see in different ways. And this is what's caused retailers to go on their digital transformation journeys. So you hear a lot of talk about digital transformation, but what it's really all about, it's all about being able to see your business digitally so that you can make the best decisions to, to please your customers and to, and to be profitable. And what's happening is, as it relates to IoT in general and RFID in particular, is that these technologies are what's allowing retailers to see physical things. And we're talking about billions of things, not just a few, but literally billions of things. Every product, every process, every facility, every ship, train, truck, all the way down to maybe the employees and even the customers. So we want to be able to see those things so that we can make sure that we can do our job, which is to meet, to get supply and demand to meet together. It's a big deal. It's a really big deal. Yeah. That's interesting, Brian. I, I think that is a big deal. I can tell you, for me as a consumer, I'm never running out of TP in my house again. So we've really shifted <laughs> what we're stocking at home. Uh, and I think we're forever changed from that experience. Um, but yeah. I, I think it's interesting to me is like, what have I done differently? Like the biggest surprise for me is that I now have embraced online grocery shopping, which is not something I did before the pandemic. But what I found was that my local grocery shop store really adapted well. And that experience is quite good. Um, so it kind of feeds into that idea of consumer expectations have changed. Um, I know that I have higher expectations for my in-store experiences because I don't go shopping as much as I used to uh, because those online services have become so robust. Um, what I thought was interesting in the RSR report, Brian, also was that looking at the research on retail executives' view of RFID and the Internet of Things, the 95%, that's like almost everybody, said that the ability to reliably know where the inventory is located is really key to their digital transformation strategies. And frankly, as a consumer, I wholeheartedly agree. Well, it's absolutely the essential component. If you can't do anything else right, you need to get this part right. You need to be able to expose inventory to consumers so that they can buy it. It's kind of straightforward. Right, um, yeah. 95% of retailers pointing to inventory visibility as key to their digital transformation strategies is feels so significant. Brian, what were some of your other key takeaways from the survey results? Well, it's so fascinating. It, it's because it goes well beyond uh, visibility. That was number one with a bullet. But when you start to think of some of the other things, it's really all about optimizing the business in the new business model. So it's warehouse processes, transportation, reducing um, reducing uh, losses from shrink and spoilage. It's to be able to determine the best place to put your inventory to meet the demand, to manage devices proactively, to optimize the physical space, the store space we're talking about. All of these things are really important and they're all enabled by digital twins because if you can see it digitally, you can analyze it. And if you can analyze it, you can optimize it. So when I think about this, I think it's a kind of a permutation of the old Drucker comment about what gets what gets measured gets managed. In this new world, is what gets observed gets managed, and that's what we're in. That's what we're trying to do right now. Yeah, I thought that was really fascinating too. The breadth of the list of priorities. Yeah. You know, there were just so many things identified as important. Um, and frankly, so few things identified as unimportant, which I thought was so fascinating. I think we have that um, chart number five to show as well. It was like inventory accuracy, stock management, fraud, loss prevention, brand protection. It was honestly like everything on the chart was rated as important or very or somewhat important, which I thought was really interesting. I mean, the only standout here for us was that that darling of RFID demos, the connected fitting room was the one that didn't score very highly as important. Yeah, this is fascinating. I mean, this is a, an impressive list and a little bit shocking that the numbers are so high. So you would expect inventory accuracy and stock management to be number one. That's the obvious problem. We were really surprised that fraud and loss prevention was number two. We expected to see it in the top five, but number two surprised us. On the flip side, connected fitting room. One of the problems with IoT technologies in general is that they can descend into creepiness really quickly. 
and consumers are remarkably sensitive to that and therefore retailers are as well so that's good we want we want people to be cautious about going too far and if you look at this list there's plenty of things to fix before you get to that one so let's focus on the top five or six yeah um hey brian you know just as a aside i you know i love vocabulary but um i wanted to mention too in the report you look at a range of iot technologies broadly and you include a lot of signaling technologies including bluetooth and, be and beacons Right. Um, and I think it's really true that people often use the word RFID really to mean RAIN RFID. And when yes. I say RAIN RFID, I don't mean like the weather in Seattle. It's uh, the RFID industry uses RAIN RFID as a term to refer to the products that are compatible with an open global GS1 specification and ISO standard. And really to differentiate amongst the different types of RFID. Um, RAIN RFID is the fastest growing segment of the RFID market with over 100 billion tag chips sold to date. It's a lot. Um, because I think it's very unique in that Rain RFID can identify up to like a thousand items per second without line of sight, and without touching, right? It can be very close or at a distance of 30 feet. And Rain RFID tags are battery free and they really just cost pennies, which makes it the ideal technology for very large scale IoT systems. Just like what retailers need when the thing in their Internet of Things is everything they sell. That's exactly right. You know, RAIN RFID is so critical because of the things that you mentioned. Standards became very important very quickly because of the sheer volume of the of the tags that you could potentially use. Think, go back to the number of items that flow through the retail uh, supply chain or the supply network. There's billions of items. So the the ability to standardize on those very quickly, the the, the ability for those things to be delivered at low cost and to be highly reliable becomes very critical very fast. RAIN RFID does exactly that. Thank you. Hey, um, one of the things I had noticed in the report is that you looked at the difference between successful retailers and those that are underperforming and how yeah. and measuring how they're thinking differently about IoT technologies. Um, what I thought was interesting too is, is, I think you pointed this out, like the differences in the level of sophistication of the applications they're moving too. So like everyone accepts that inventory accuracy is important, but moving into that, those predictive models, um, I thought that was interesting. What else did you find in that area? Well, first of all, Ed, let's let's explain a little bit about winners versus everybody else. We use a very simple measure. We look at the industry averages for year over year growth and companies that exceed that are winners. And mm -hmm. companies that meet that are average performers and companies that fail to meet that our laggards in our reports. We usually group average and laggards together. And the reason we do that is because they have different behaviors. This is this is so unique uh, to RSR reports. So we take it for granted because it's been so consistent. Winners don't just do the other things better than everybody else. For example, winners, they focus on controlling costs just as much as any retailer. But we notice that uh, winners also have a different agenda. And one of the things we found out in this report is that winners, winners very clearly value RFID technology more than average and underperformers do. So they're, what that tells us is they're farther along in their digital transformation. They see the value, they see the opportunity, and they see the underlying business challenge, which is that they need to redesign their operational model. So this is exciting stuff, but the implications are huge. So let's just take inventory. We talked about inventory earlier. Um, insecurity about your inventory position leads you to do one of a few things, and none of them are good. The first one you can do is you can buy more inventory and kind of flood, flood the field with inventory, but that's really expensive. And you're seeing a little bit of that right now in, in recent earnings uh, by Macy's and Target. There's too much inventory in the wrong places. And, and so as a consumer, I'm thinking about what great sales we're going to see in November and mm -hmm. December, right? It's going to be good. Um, <laughs> so if you don't know what your inventory position is and you don't what, know what demand is, you, you're not likely to get that joining of demand and, and supply right. And you'll flood it with inventory. The other thing you can do is you can risk disappointing your customer. And that's a bad thing. And we've all experienced that. How many times, Gail, in your digital shopping journey have you gotten on the on the app and it says we have this item you order it and then you get a notice back a little bit later from the retailer saying we actually don't have that would yeah. you like this instead yeah that's not so great all right what's your response to that uh well i look i have 
find another retailer, quite frankly. Yeah, it's pretty that, that's, yeah. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the third point. You can lose your customers because of that. Customers are remarkably unforgiving about that. So um, that's that's just the first problem. Retailer Retail winners get that. We wonder why average and underperformers don't get it. But that's just where they start. Once they can see it, winners are focused on optimization of their new business model. And so they're just further down the road, much further down the road. Yeah, one of the things that might be considered one of those more sophisticated applications is product authentication. And I saw in the report that 92% of respondents saw value in product authentication. Brian, what did you think when you saw product authentication up so high in the report? We saw that as an indication of how important returns are becoming. Now, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's, it's implied rather than expressed in the report. We'll probably study this much more closely next year. But one of the things that COVID did, as we, as we talked in the very beginning, is it, it vastly accelerated those omnichannel journeys. And, and part of that is it vastly accelerated the number of returns coming, coming back to the retailer. And we've all done this, you know, when we shop fashion, um, I'm just like anybody else. If I'm buying something that I'm not, that I've never bought before, I'm not sure of the sizing, I'm not sure of the color, I'm not sure of the design. So I might buy two or three of them and I'll return a couple of them, keep one. That's called bracketing and consumers do this a lot. Um, so think about the impact of that. So when I when when a consumer brackets, two, two of the three items that are going to get shipped to the consumer are now out, not available to some other consumer. So you have to you have to cover that. Plus you're also covering the expense of doing it, et cetera, et cetera. And Amazon has created this expectation of free returns, right? So that's that's made it even more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, the returns volume problem is just e exploded on retailers. But they have found from that that there's a, a, a way to use returns to create new value in the stores, essentially to use the stores as a, as a point of return, and you can get the customer back in. You can potentially sell them something else, sell them more, improve the experience, improve the relationship. So there's a lot of goodness in it. But one of the problems that comes out of that is authentication. As soon as you open that door, you also open the opportunity for fraud. And I think of this, you know, I think of high-end, um, Sporting shoes, it's a big problem, right? A lot of fraud opportunities there. So um, retailers are very, very interested in the, in the flip side of selling something and then that's returning something and that brings up authentication. Yeah, I think this is a super interesting area, Brian. Well, you know, and it's absolutely. one where Rain RFID again has a very unique and useful role. Um, we think it, of it also, not only just in that retail experience, but also through the full life cycle of a product. So when you've got a, a product that can be uniquely identified during the manufacturing process, or even before that, where you're tracking the materials, but then you're able to combine those that information through the digital twin, right? The date and other critical information about a product source, that can then also enable recalls or other kinds of uh, tracking of sourcing and materials. Um, and then thinking about how you can use authentication throughout a secure supply chain, where the authenticity of items are verified along that path. Exactly. Because we do see there's a challenge too, where there's fake products that enter, enter the supply chain, not just at the consumer's end, right? That's very interesting. But then we also look to a future where we've got consumer applications where I as a customer can actually verify a product's authenticity when I purchase or receive an item. Um, and I think that's really interesting to think about what can be enabled by this technology and really thinking differently about what is an authentic product um, what's unique about RAIN uh, RFID technology is that it's highly scalable, again, so it can authenticate thousands of items instantly, so it can work in automated systems where there's conveyors or things are moving through uh, uh, the supply chain. But um, the other thing here is that I think that uh, we're going to, when you know, when you look at how many retailers are looking broadly at a, a number of use cases, authentication is a, is a use case that can be added into an existing inventory application. So then further extending the value of that our, the investment that retailers have already made. And we think about what's coming next is like advancing the security of authentication using cryptographic authentication for an additional layer of security. So you can really truly know that that product you're holding in your hands is authentic. I think this is a real game changer. 
I think so too. You know, yeah. just to interrupt you for a second, we, I, I mentioned something that happens at the very end of, of mm -hmm. the, call it a dialogue between a consumer and a retailer. But in fact, that this whole process really begins at the moment it leaves the manufacturer's dock. When you sure. think about authentication it, and following it all the way, the product all the way through its path to consumption, um, authentication is, is important in every single one of those steps because there's so many places for it to leak. There's so many places for it to get wrong. So we, we want to fix those problems before they happen. Yeah, and I also noticed it was one of those areas of differentiation between retail winners and others. I think the numbers were 71% of the winners considered brand authentication as an opportunity for impact, and I think only 46, 45% yeah, of others. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, it is fascinating. It, it points to it points to what I said earlier about winners. They're thinking much more proactively. Re, uh, average and underperformer are, tend to be reactive in nature. Something happens and they say, "Oh my gosh, we got to do something about this." Uh, winners are are thinking about prevention, and so that they never encounter the problem in the first place. And you see that you see that in the marketplace. You can see it when you shop. You can tell a winner just by walking into the store. Yeah. You know, uh, this is a small pivot, but it's another really important brain RFID application, and that's self-checkout. Yes. And I think from the report, we saw that 60% um, of the survey respondents identified self-checkout as something as, as a competitive differentiator. Uh, right. And I was wondering if you could just share your thoughts on self-checkout. Is it a trend you think we're going to continue to see? Mm -hmm. Brian, well, before you yeah. share your thoughts, okay. okay. In, um, do you remember when you came to Seattle right after the first Amazon Go store opened up here? You called me up and asked if I wanted to go shopping. I do remember that. Yes, I do. <laughs> I think we have some photos. Um, you were in that store looking up and under the counters, covering the packages. Like you were really testing out that experience. And I think that guy in the store really didn't know what to make of you. Um, <laughs> we didn't steal anything, but we wanted to see what it would take, right? Well, I'm a geek, you know, I like wires and boxes. <laughs> and um, I know I study business use cases, but underneath the, the covers, I'm just another retail technologist. But to the bigger issue, um, uh, Self-checkout has been a, you know, a gleam in retailers' eyes for a long, long time. When you think about um, technology as it existed in the stores up until relatively recently, the only visible piece of technology in most stores was the checkout. Mm -hmm. um, and, that's, and it's because that's all we could do. Back in the late 1980s, that's all we could accomplish. We could, we could track inventory movement and we could, we could use that to inform our purchases, to you know, to inform our our management decisions, uh, but it was it really wasn't very friendly for the consumer. It was just a place for us to transact um, and to take money in exchange for products. Um, but consumers are using technology right there in the aisle all the time, every day. And so the question then comes up: Well, gosh, if we're having a digital transaction with or digital conversation with consumers while they're shopping, while they're building their basket. Why don't we just build the transaction up and and allow it to be allow it to be transacted when the consumer is done? And that's a good idea. The, the reason it hasn't happened so far is because the technologies weren't quite there. But again, let me just reiterate what I said earlier. The consumer today is carrying essentially more technology in their pockets and purses than I ever had at my disposal as a CIO. And they pay for it. <laughs> it's theirs. They own it. But they're willing to they're willing to engage in a dialogue with us to to um, to find what they're looking for. Well, we can we can use that very same path, that very same digital path, to do the transaction part of the work and to and to make that a friendly and happy experience. And it has great implications. For example, a lot of people don't know that that front end, that little set of kiosks in front of the checkout lane, is is on a per square foot basis is most profitable in the whole store. Wouldn't that be great if we could release a lot of that to um, high profit items for consumers to buy just, to, just in the end when they're getting ready to walk out of the store? That'd be fun, be very profitable. Um, we have to solve some problems, right? There's, it's not as easy as all that. We have to, in some cases, bag the items. We might have to weigh the items. We might have to do a few of those kinds of things. Those are exceptions that prove the rule. We can move toward a self-checkout model 
in many, many cases and really improved the shopping journey for consumers. Yeah, I think that's interesting too. Um, and you know, one of the things that we see too with retailers looking at Rain RFID for self checkout is that you know, as it, it really changes the consumer experience. Yeah. You know, compared, I don't like scanning barcodes because I can never find the barcode <laughs> on the product. Uh, there's just so much less fumbling at the checkout stand when you can just set things down and then they're read instantly all together at the same time. You know, as we know, Rain does not require line of sight, so. You know, we see retailers that are looking at not just self-checkout, but self-checkout and loss prevention combined that work together. So employee employees are not needed to re re remove a security device, right? Because just that the, the system knows that an item has been purchased, so then it knows not to alert about that item at the door, right? Those uh, things that are not purchased then, of course, would alert. But what also is happening here is the combination is when you bring in that unique item data, you're now also getting a lot more information about what is going through those doors, what's being lost, when and where, about what specific thing, it's not just an alert, it's this specific thing at this specific time. Um, so I, I find that super interesting. So beyond checkout, that whole combination of, uh, tech, of use cases that are enabled by Rain RFID, Brian, any thoughts on that? Well, it, it gets to this notion of optimizing the store space. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about that. When you were talking, I was thinking about heat maps. And I was mm -hmm. thinking about um, being able to, to, to understand where traffic is in the store. Um, that's just one use case. There are many, many use cases. I, I want to go back to something you said a second ago about, um, about scanning barcodes versus an RFID. And it's a perfect case in point. One of the things I used to obsess over when I was a retail CIO is, is the notion that a technology has to be easier to use than to ignore. And if you make, if, if a customer, for example, has a product in, their, in her hand and she's fumbling with her iPhone to scan the item, it's not gonna be long before she says, I'm, why am I doing this? This is not convenient. This is not, I don't like this. Um, and as a matter of fact, I think that's what you just said. So it has to be easier to use than to ignore. Um, now everything has its place. You know, there's a place for barcodes. Barcodes revolutionized what retail could do in the late 1980s. QR codes are amazing for what they do. They can unlock all kinds of uh, uh, content about a product if you care to know about it. Yeah. So for example, if I pick out a gallon jug of clover milk, do I need to know, do I need to read a QR code to find out what's in clover milk? I already know. I've made a choice. And I made a choice, God knows when, you know, months or even years ago to choose that brand, that product, mm -hmm. and to buy it. I just need to, I just need to buy it. Thank you. Um, yeah. and so so everything has its place and the technology has to be there and available to you. But but you were asking other questions. One of the things I wanted to bring up is that what really accelerates um, RFID adoption, Rain RFID and other IoT technologies as well, is AI. And we don't talk very much about this, but we need to. One of the things that these technologies do is throw off an immense amount of data. And just a huge, I call it a tsunami of data that overwhelms retailers' traditional abilities to sift through and make sense of it. Uh, along comes AI, which is extremely good at detecting patterns in huge blocks of data. And to, to essentially to create statistical relationships between those data. And that's precisely what is needed to be able to support all of this. So when you think about your, you, when you think about the acceleration of adoption of Rain RFID, you really have to look at what I, excuse me, AI has enabled it to do, to be able to take these these huge oceans of data and turn them into something that retailers can use to optimize their business. There is so much to uncover here. I think when talking about automated self checkout and self health checkout. But I want to shift gears just a little bit one more time okay. um, and talk about something uh, that is on top of mind for many people, and that's consumers and industry alike, and it's sustainability. Right. And right. we know that retail, we, you've already talked about it, produces a massive amount of waste. And so recently we've seen some retailers are embracing initiatives that reduce waste. Brian, what are you, what sustainability initiatives are you seeing in retail, and what is the role that Rain RFID can play there? 
Boy, it's a huge role. Um, IoT in general and, and, and RAIN RFID in particular has a huge role in this. Think about, for example, um, a grocery store. Um, I joke a lot about grocery stores because I work in fast moving consumer goods. So it's, you know, it's my native land. Um, and one of the things I impress upon people who haven't worked in that sector is that they sell things that rot. So you <laughs> need to move it, you need to move it fast. Um, you know, it's got a shelf life of just, you know, days, not weeks. And uh, one of the things you need to do is to be able to know when, when a product is, 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 is getting to the end of its shelf life. Rain RFID can help that happen, right? It can tell you, it can tell you what the product is, when it was, when it was uh, purchased, when it was picked. It can tell you all kinds of really rich information. Now, what should a retailer do? Right now, what a retailer does is they throw it away. And the, and the amount of waste in a grocery store is, is shocking. How about if I know that something has a seven day shelf life and, and, I, and I, I wanna move it, I just discount it at five days and sell mm -hmm. it at a discount because I know in two more days, I'm gonna have to throw it away. How about that? Is that a sustainability issue? Absolutely it is. So that's just one example of what, what, I, what I'm thinking about. It gets back to what we said in the beginning. If you can see it digitally, you can you can analyze it, and if you can analyze it, you can optimize it. And there, the, the opportunities are almost endless. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I think that's super interesting, keeping good track of that clover milk so that you can drink it before it expires as opposed to throw it away after it does, yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. We yeah. really think about sustainability and impinge in kind of three main areas uh, where rain can play a unique and important role. You know, first, what we just talked about, which is we call it, we consider it like protecting our natural resources. You know, food is a resource and, we, you know, humans should be using all of the food that we're producing well as opposed to disposing it, of it. So the main applications in this space are around optimizing food distribution for freshness, safety and waste reduction. And like you mentioned, you know, using the Impinge platform to track fresh produce, strawberries, for example, or milk from far to, farm to store maintaining optimal freshness and then and using it before it goes goes bad. Um, the second big area, which I think is also interesting, is about operating efficiently in that mindset of operating efficiently so that you're reducing your fuel consumption or emissions and eliminating kind of unnecessary activities that use um, mostly, you know, full, food or other other kinds of resources. So, you know, we've all seen stories of like waste caused by overstocking product ex expirations and things like that. It is really terrible to think about clothing and other goods ending up in landfills or being burned. Um, we, it makes really good business sense to drive efficiencies, but it also is important in, in this, from a sustainability perspective. You know, one other area when we think about sustainability is that um, responsible reuse or disposal, right? We don't we can't keep everything, but when a product does come to the end of its useful life, uh, using Rain RFID to identify that item as genuine, to connect data back to manufacturing information, knowing the materials or other information that em enables a dis responsible program for reuse or disposal. Um, that yeah. returns management you talked about, right? If you are sure that that thing is genuine, you can resell it and then you don't throw it away. Or you can, um, uh, you know, we see a lot of retailers now uh, accepting backed products that they have sold, like uh, apparel retailers are taking back clothing, like Patagonia and Eileen Fisher, um, and then be, and then reselling those, and they're able to verify that those things are genuine. So it feels like there's a lot here, and we think about like if we if we really think about being able to see and then track and manage well everything in a retail system, there's just opportunities to. Um, be more responsible about how we're creating, yeah. transmit, trans, you know, transferring and then using and disposing of things. The Patagonian and uh, Eileen Fisher examples are great ones. Those are really good examples, really, really fine retailers. They know what they're doing. It, 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 you could probably talk quite a bit, Gaylene, about the life cycle of a tag. There used to be an issue, right? Whether the tag was killed as it walked out the door. The technology has solved a lot of those kinds of problems probably too complicated to get into on this webinar, but it's um, the technology has advanced tremendously in the last 10 years. So, so you, can, you can use the RFID tag that's embedded into a garment to, to tell you a lot of things about where that garment came from, where it was manufactured, and what you should do with it next. Um, yeah. what, what's the next best thing to do with that product? 
And I think those are exciting things. But sustainability is getting to be a real, real issue. And I, I tend to think of it as a generational shift. So if you'll forgive me for telling a very fast story, I volunteered at a local concert in my little town. And it was um, it was a Gen Z artist. Um, what was his name? Mac DeMarco. Um, and so the entire audience were very young people, you know, people between 15 and 25. Um, and like all concerts, they were drinking lots of Cokes and sodas and bottles of water and stuff like that. And much to my amazement, the young people at the at the end, they cleaned up after themselves. There was there were close to a thousand people in this room and uh, they they picked the stuff up. They separated it. They put them in the right receptacles. So I was an usher on this floor and our job afterwards as a volunteer was to clean it up. And there was nothing to clean up. They'd yeah. done it for us. I, and I was laughing. I thought, okay, this is Gen Zers. Boomers like me would have left the trash all over the place because we're remarkably insensitive to this stuff. Um, I was so impressed by those kids. And I thought, this has meaning. This, yeah. this is an indicative of, what, of where we're going. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Those expectations are changing with the changing generations. And right. I definitely see that in my own kids too. Yeah. They're pretty good at taking out the garbage. Mm. <laughs> Can I borrow one, please? Yeah. <laughs> well, we are getting close to the end of our time, and I just want to leave a little bit of time for our Q&A portion uh, of today. So if you have questions, please post them using the question section of the control panel. Uh, we have a, one question. Let's start with it that came in earlier. Uh, I'll give this to you, Brian. Okay. What is holding retailers back from adopting RAIN IRFID or other IoT technologies? We call those organizational inhibitors, and it's actually a section of our methodology. Um, it, if, if, you, if you see the challenge and you understand the opportunity, then why aren't you doing something about it? Uh, and um, in this case, um, it, it falls into two categories. One is lack of vision, and that's a real problem for average and underperformers. And we talk quite a bit about that in the report, um, that the, the, the executives are somewhat skeptical of, of these kinds of technologies. And, you know, at the, I don't mean to, to, to belittle them. I am one of them. I was an executive for a long time, and I'm a, definitely a boomer. But uh, you can hear people saying, gee, I've run this store for 50 years without this. Why do I suddenly need this now? And um, that's skeptical. So, so there's, that, there's that issue. With um, the other one, and it's more of a, a problem for overperformers, is they, they are very concerned about their legacy system's ability to absorb the data. Um, and that, that's a real challenge. So um, I think that the, the, the possible solutions available to retailers uh, are much, much better now than they even were five years ago. As I mentioned earlier, AI has had a lot to do with that. Uh, plus, let's let's be blunt here. The RAIN RFID technologies have improved remarkably in the last 10 years. Reader technology has improved a lot. The tag has improved a lot. The cost continues to be ratcheted down. So all those kinds of things are gradually being pushed to the sidelines. What we recommend that retailers do is they as they engage in in very concise pilot projects. And when for those companies that are selling to retailers, help them to get there by by uh, organizing pilot projects that that um, demonstrate the value of these technologies. Gail, I am going to give you this next question. Mm -hmm. What other sectors are you seeing adopting RAIN RFID besides apparel retail? Uh, yeah, well, obviously, I think the biggest impact in the last two years has been on the supply chain. And so, and every industry has a supply chain. So I would say it's not so much a, a an industry per se, but it is really like anything related to the supply chain is being studied extensively right now. So healthcare, um, shipping, you know, just I would say that's the biggest focus. We um, we you know are continuing to hear uh, from businesses that are interested in automation technologies. So things about improving the manufacturing process. Uh, tracking uh, tracking uh, parts as they're assembled, so more around that work in work in whip, whip work whip, work in progress uh, tracking. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say just in general, it's anything related to the supply chain is being studied today. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna do one more question, 
and you guys can fight it out on who takes it, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is real-time item location feasible. With 20,000 products, can RFID readers really keep track of all these products when they're on and when they fall off the grid without interference? Short answer is yes. I don't know how <laughs> to say that. Yes, it's been demonstrated. It's been, you know, um, um, one of the companies that that really pioneered this in the in the fashion space was Macy's, and those stories are all good stories. Um, the the technology is capable of doing that. A lot of the earlier problems with with uh, blind spots in the let's call it the reader grid in a physical location have been solved. Um, the the reader technology, both the mobile and the fixed technologies, have really improved. Um, you know, I think the other thing to think about here is, is you know, how, how real time does it need to be, right? Good, good point. Yeah. <laughs> you need to know where things are, where it is important to know where they are, right? Do we need to know that they have arrived at a store? Are they in or out of the storeroom? Are they on or off the, short, the, 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 the sales floor, right? I mean, I think we kind of over-exaggerate this idea of real-time location because we're kind of seeing our own real-time location on our phones with our uh, with uh, Google Maps and things like that. But I think we really need to know anywhere there it is important and a reader can be installed, things can be read very quickly and efficiently. And I think those systems are quite robust and really as, a, as robust as they need to be. Yeah. You, you brought up a good point and let me elaborate on that, Gaylene. Um, real-time is one of those difficult difficult phrases. I wish we had different phrases for it. Yeah. Let me talk about it in this way. We, retailers make decisions in cycles. It used to be monthly, quarterly, annually, weekly, then daily, maybe intraday. Um, I prefer to think about it as if, if, if you're looking for the business use case or the business justification for adopting any new technology like this, one of the questions you should ask is, can I remove one cycle? So mm -hmm. if I'm if I'm on a daily cycle of decisioning, mm -hmm. uh, is it can I can I make a better decision if I can make it in the middle of the day? If I'm on an hourly cycle, can I do it in a minute? And if I'm in a minute cycle, can I do it real time, true real time? So so it's the next best time. Unfortunately, that's not a real marketable phrase. I haven't figured <laughs> out a way to make that sound really exciting, but it's really about improving cycles, decision cycles. Um, I'm going to pick on loss prevention. We didn't even mention loss prevention, but I want to bring it up here because when's the right time to know whether uh, somebody is walking out of the store with an item, right? It's right when they're walking out of the store with an item. <laughs> it happens there's a huge opportunity for RAIN RFID right now in the industry because those mag systems that have been in place since the 1990s are really, really near their end of life. And so there's a refresh cycle going on right now, which I'm sure you guys are taking advantage of. Um, but when do you need to know that you're that a customer is walking out the door with an item? You need to know now. When should you know that you need to cut a, re, a, a replenishment order? Well, and without Rain RFID, you might make that at the end of the day, and you look at your shelves, right? You do a cycle count. But if um, if you can track what's moving in in somewhat of real time in, inside of the store and compare it to your forecast, you can know to cut an order in the morning for a replenishment and get the delivery one day earlier than you might otherwise. Those are the kind of things that I'm talking about. Just take one cycle out of the decision process. Yeah. Yeah. On the last prevention comment too, Brian, just to add there, it's, uh, you, you know, you want to know when something's exiting, but what we do here from retailers is that they want to know more about what is exiting, when, and, and so that they can start to match uh, their loss prevention efforts with, um, other kinds of strategies, right? Because people aren't chasing down um, shoplifters anymore, right? But they are putting in some pretty sophisticated preemptive, uh, you know, uh, strategies to keep, to prevent that stuff from happening in the first place. We so. left off where? Um, so yeah. you know, lots of retailers where? have several doors. They have a north door and an mm -hmm. east door. And um, um, maybe you should close one of those doors because you're getting ripped off out of that door. You know, these those are the kind of decisions you can make. Yeah, I'll never forget the story of a retailer who told us in a meeting that they had a significant loss uh, drop in their loss uh, stolen items when they uh, changed their approach to taking inventory by taking inventory of all of the items that were in a sealed box. So they kept the the new process kept the tape on the box, 
and they used RFID to read the items inside the box. Well, simply not having their employees open up that box on the loading dock or in the in the storeroom, you know, things were just getting tucked in pockets, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a big differentiator for them. So it is about knowing. I think knowing delivers them in the into the space of being able to respond and react. Uh, I think well, we're running out of time, Allison. Yes. So wrap yes, us up. The questions are so good. The conversation is so great. Uh, I am sorry, we do have to wrap up. Uh, and I was hoping that each of you could give us just a quick 30, 60 seconds or less um, concluding thoughts. Uh, Brian, I'll start with you. Well, digital transformation is a strategic agenda for retailers and retail winners clearly understand that. Average and underperformers need to be brought to that understanding. And it's all about getting demand and supply together. That's well, that's what our function is as a business. It used to be a lot easier. We did it in a physical location called a store, and now it can happen in a number of ways. That requires visibility, and that's where Internet of Things or digital twins uh, becomes a really big deal. Brain RFID is a major component of, of a total solution. And so retailers need to think about that. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Brian. I think for me, I thought that this report was really helpful in understanding how retailers who have adopted RAIN are succeeding in a challenging environment. You know, I think we learned a lot about that um, and seeing how, re how visibility into inventory can impact so many areas of the business. Um, I actually came away with it feeling optimistic about where the retail industry is going. And it matters to me personally as a conscious consumer because I care about my impact making choices to support businesses with an ethical and sustainable practice, mindful of resources being used in manufacturing. And I want the companies that I support to operate efficiently and not have a huge carbon footprint of waste, right? And being thoughtful about how they're reusing and recycling their materials. So I value those things and we value those things here at Impinge as well. We're working to build products that make a difference, products that drive efficiencies, reduce waste and enable a circular economy. At Impinge, we're commit, we're, we are committed not only to reducing our own environmental footprint, but also to help our customers use our products and their sustainability initiatives. 